Another guy from Austria, he came all the way uh, to VRU here today and to give a talk. The title is up here, The Winner Takes It All. It's about uh, how to apply coding, coding skills. And uh, this makes sense for this course because the guest lecture is in a coding course. So uh, Gerald will give you um, a little motivation of why you should put in the hard work and learn to code. And uh, without further ado, um, this is Gerald Hörhan from Austria, also known as the Investment Fund. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. So. Who, want, who wants me to talk in English and who wants me to talk in German? Okay, okay. then we'll do English. Okay, well, thank you for the invitation. Yesterday I was at the Frankfurt School where I was introduced that rents are too high in Frankfurt. And I suggested that was a bit uh, unfitting for a university which is business oriented. But uh, there is one thing which probably will make my life as a landlord easier. You know, many of you, at least who follow me on social media, know that I collect ugly small apartments, <laughs> that I like to collect them. But what is going to make these things in the future much easier? What is the, what is the biggest problem if you have ugly small apartments? What is the biggest problem? Well, sometimes, as ever, one of you have been on a submarine, an U-boat. Well, I've once been on a submarine in Cayman Islands, you know, they are sightseeing, and the submarine, you know, is, is something special, but in war, a submarine is not something so nice. And if you have a tenant who is a submarine, let's say, which doesn't have an official existence, it's very hard to get any money out of them, even if they don't pay. They're just, you know, you have to avoid submarines as tenants, as a U-boat to vermeiden als Mieter to say it in German. Some of these things go a little bit better in German, unfortunately. But uh, so I thought, in the future, what, what I'm doing now to avoid submarines? What I'm doing now? Yeah? Yes, well, we check the whole digital uh, footprint of the person and some, you know, documents, like, you know, labor contract, rental income, uh, income statement, bank reference letters, but we also check somebody on social media. And if you see somebody's always in the casino, you know, you're partying, destroying everything, you know, you might say, stop. But in a few years, I'm sure I'm going to have something else which is going to make my life much, much easier. And I'm going to talk about this today. Let me ask you a few further questions. What is the best-selling engine oil in the Western Hemisphere? British Petroleum or Shell, or what is the best selling? Okay. Who else is for Shell? Who is for British Petroleum? Who is for Exxon? What, what is the best selling hair shampoo in the Western Hemisphere? Hair shampoo, hair gel. L'Oreal, Brockton and Gamble? Okay, L'Oreal? Okay. Let me ask you another question. If you're a real estate agent, who is currently your client usually? What is your, who is your client? If you're a real estate agent, to whom do you sell? Also, an wen verkauft das Immobilienmakler? Yes? Yeah, to single persons, but not only. Sometimes you sell to different people. Sometimes you know, sell to families and couples. Yeah? Well, investors make up about 35% or 30% of the market. People like me, yes, they exist, but uh, they, are not, they have more people who look for their own home than as investors looking for ugly small apartments to rent out. <laughs> But uh, if I ask you again, let's say, if you have a couple as a client, who often makes the decisions? Let's say a couple looking for the apartment, a dream home, or a single family home, or so. this Eggenheim. Who is, it, who is making the decisions? Wer macht die Entscheidung? Well, I wouldn't say, I, you're not politically correct, I thought. Universities are always experts in political correctness, today you would say the life partner or lebenspartner, 
to be correct because you have all kinds of different arrangements uh, in today's world. At least in Berlin, I mean, if I would say a woman, I think I would probably, uh, in this case, already get, you know, be prohibited from speaking at the university, possibly. <laughs> we are not in Berlin, unfortunately, but, well, fortunately, in Berlin, it's good for partying, but not for real estate right now. But uh, I always say, this I have to say in German, you know, often the decision making is, Schatzi, ich hab dich lieb. Schatzi, I love you. And I always say, please say, Schatzi, I don't love you. That's much cheaper. <laughs> Who will be the client of the real estate agent in 10 years from now? The biggest one. Who will the real estate agent sell to in 10 years? Schatzi? Or single guys? Or investors? Who will be the biggest one? I'll give you the answer a little bit later. But things will change very drastically. Let me ask you another question. Who do you think, who would agree or disagree with this statement? Let's say who would disagree with this, because I think more. That Donald Trump in combination with Amazon, and perhaps in combination with Facebook and Google, as a, as a let's say, fighters in, for the free world. Who would agree to this? That Donald Trump, Facebook, Google, Amazon, as a representative said, fight us for the free world. And who would disagree? Everybody would disagree. Very interesting. Let's start with, uh, let's say, history part of the digital economy, things which all have already happened. Let's start a little bit with a history trip, and then we'll start with an experiment. A lot of, uh, I hope, please, if I'm politically incorrect, I apologize to anybody a priori, if you don't like political incorrectness or feel insulted, please cover your ears and eyes so that you don't see and hear. Yeah, also in Deutsch, falls ich jemand beleidigen sollte aufgrund von politischer Inkorrektheit, würde ich euch bitten, eure Ohren und Augen zu schließen. But I'm sure none of you had, have ever had this problem, but let's assume in the virtual world that you would have this problem. What problem do a lot of people have at night? And in the future, they might even have this problem much more, or possibly not. What is one of the biggest problems they have? What biggest problem have the people at night? Yes? Yes, and why can many people not fall asleep? <laughs> yes, partially, but sometimes the, the things are much more natural. It's a natural drive. Yeah? People are lonely and people want to have sex. <laughs> and let's assume you have uh, three platforms to solve your wishes, or your desires, or your natural, uh, the, uh, natural drive, whatever you want to call it. You have one platform which has, I want to have, xxx.com, and which has 100,000, let's say, members, or whatever. We have one, a second platform which has, I will have, uh, no, I could have, and which has 500,000 members, and the third one has, I will have, xxx.com, and has a million. Apparently, that's one of the biggest markets online, so this is not, it's justifiably something you should study. And who, if you, in the hypothetical situation that you had this drive at night, which I'm sure none of you ever have, had, and none of you will ever have, but a lot of people do have, unfortunately. Which one of you uh, would choose the platform with 100,000 participants? Which one of you would choose the platform with 500,000 participants? And which one of you would choose the platform with 1 million participants? <laughs> yes, you proved yourself something very simple. One of the basic rules of the digital economy. Let's say you own a hotel company and you want to make 10, let's say, if you have one, 10 times as many visitors or participants, how much does your revenue increase? If you have 10 times as many people coming, pay VIP memberships, advertising, how much is your revenue going to be? 10 times as many visitors. How much is your revenue going to be? Yeah, 
I box a middle 10 times as much. And what is uh, your company value going to be? If you have 10 times as many visitors, 10 times as many people coming, 10 times as much money coming in, what is going to be your company value as so the fair value? What? 10 times as much, and that is absolutely wrong. <laughs> well, what is a good bit? That's a British statement, but what is a good bit? Even that is wrong. Very wrong, even. Unfortunately. Because uh, assume you have a hotel company, and if you have a hotel company and you want to make 10 times as much revenue, can you do this with the same amount of hotels or do you need more hotels? Assuming that you do legal stuff, not, you know, let's say refugees, illegal having 10 refugees in one room, or, you know, or having, you know, let's say a love house or anything in the hotel. Assuming that you do legal stuff and obey the rules and regulations of the hotel industry and continue to operate the hotel and not abuse it, do you need more than, if you make, want to make 10 times as much revenue, can you do this with the same amount of hotels? No. You only need how much more hotels? Oh, nine, ten times more hotels. And if you're a restaurant chain, a restaurant, and you want to make ten times as much revenues, can you do it with the same amount of restaurants? No, you also need more pasta, more fish, more wine, more cutlery, more waiters, and more locations, because, you know, people cannot sit you know, above, so there's some limits to the room. So which means if you have ten times as much revenue in many businesses, you have nine times or ten times as much cost. So the profit is also 9 or 10 times, or 11 times, or 12 times higher. But in a digital business, do you have a lot more cost to run a platform with 10 times as many more visitors? You have need some more customer support, some more hours on web space, a few other things a little bit more, but that's about it. What does it mean for the cash flow or for the profit of the company? What does it mean? If the revenues do go 10 times, but the costs only increase by 50%, or double, what does it mean for the cash flow of the business? It explodes. And uh, what you have just proved yourself by this experiment is a function of the digital economy. In most classic economic scenarios, Let's say there are many market participants, like in hotels or restaurants, you know, the different restaurants, and people go to this one or this one, but in the digital world, it's called winner takes it all. Winner takes it all means that only the first three get anything from the cake. The first one gets about 50%, the second one 30 the third one 15%, and for all the rest of the market, there's 5% left. The Olympic principle of winner takes it all, and that's but the whole digital economy works. And if you look at it on the global scale, you have companies like Google, Facebook, Airbnb, Uber, uh, Spotify, and so on, which are all winner takes it all, and which are worth sometimes hundreds of billions, or even more than 1,000 billions in dollars, and which have sometimes a stock market capitalization, which is bigger than the GDP of many countries. And it's only going to rise. And even in Germany, if you want to look for a piece of real estate online, which most people do, how many choices do you have? Yeah, in was called in Welt. And we have some smaller ones. If you look for a used car, it's the same thing. And if you go dating, you also don't have many choices. But that's what I'm describing is history. We are just talking about companies being worth 1,000 Million, uh, billion dollars, so 1,000 milliarden dollar. That's, we are starting, we are discussing history, economic history. That has already happened. It has also has a few things. What would you say if you're a professor here at uh, WHU uh, would say he's homeless? Or your banker who, uh, would say he's homeless? What would you suggest? Would you believe him? What, what, what do you say if your professor is homeless? Tell me. You pay a lot of money to this university. What would you say if your professor is homeless? Then 
Yeah, but yes, but in some places of the world it's a bit, bit tricky. Because the winner takes it all principle also goes for rents and for real estate and for locations. And in Silicon Valley, where the economic power, you know, is starting to get close to the whole of Germany. I mean the let's say Apple is worth more than the, all the DAX companies together, to just give you an indication. Uh, let's say uh, apartment uh, prices and rents have become so high that professors, bankers, and uh, doctors have only two choices. The eyes are three choices, and they have chosen the third one. Number one, they live one or two hours away and stand in line in traffic for two hours. That includes Stanford professors and so on, and Berkeley professors. Number two, you live in a small American standard apartment, which costs you know five thousand to six thousand dollars per rent, where you have to put because San Francisco is quite windy. You know a towel at the roof, at the window, that you don't freeze. And if you go outside, you might need a gun or a knife because there are drug dealers outside. You have to be a bit careful on what you step, and you should also not have you know flip flops like shoes like this are better because if there are needles from drug dealing, you know it might be better to have safe shoes. Or the third option is that you're indeed homeless, but not quite what you expect as a homeless person, but that you live in a luxury motorhome, which costs about $400,000. That's still about a third of the price of a 50 square meter apartment in a bad neighborhood of San Francisco or Menlo Park. And so today, you do have people who are at universities, who are at banks, even programmers at Google and Facebook who choose to live in a mobile home like a tour bus, because it's simply cheaper and more pleasant than paying totally overpriced rents or apartment prices which you simply can't afford. There was also one guy which was called, let's say, a, a guy, you know, a handyman, a handwerker, who makes about $120,000 per year, he cannot even afford a studio apartment, a one uh, a room apartment. So he has to live on a houseboat, in a legal houseboat, and the police wanted to deport him, and then he would be living on the street. That's when I take it, takes it all as it already exists. What would you say, what, what would you say if your starting salary is $200,000, euros, would you say that's a lot of money? Would you be happy with 200,000 euros? Yeah. In Berlin, Mr. Slompscher would probably say they have to confiscate it, that's evil, millionaires steuer, millionaires tax, that's evil. But in San Francisco and Menlo and Silicon Valley, you're eligible for government benefits and housing subsidies, which has a, a consequence that, let's say, large companies, tech companies, banks, universities have a whole a department where people stand in line for the programmers, university teachers, bankers and so on, to, to apply for the housing subsidies and other government handouts. Because, you know, it's normally reserved for poor people, but in San Francisco, if you make $200,000 per year, you're fucking poor. <laughs> and the prediction is that this amount is going to increase to $500,000 in the next 10 years. That is, winner takes it in all, as it exists today. But we are just in the beginning, and I'm going to want to talk with you a little bit about the future. Who of you thinks an online marketer or somebody who is a good programmer has a safe job? So if you know programming, online marketing, yeah, you have a normally safe job. Like our, one of our online marketers, his performance marketer gets paid on the gross margin as a Deckungsbeitrag. He sells, you know, seminars and online courses for academy for us and master classes and so on. And he makes from us about 5,000 euros per month. And he, I'm, not his, I'm not his only customer. Probably makes 20,000 per month. And he's not, you know, he doesn't have a pedigree. He comes from Adnang Puchheim, which is, you know, some kind of a small village in Austria. And, you know, he's not very communicative, so he's not very, you know, interacting with the team. He has some difficulty. But he's very good at online marketing. But I'm going to tell you, even his fate could be in danger in a few years. And all the guys who are good at certain programming things, don't be so sure that you're going to print money in 10 years. Some of you will make even bigger amounts, but a lot of you might have to look for a new job. Let's go back, back to the dating world, and again, let's make a history trip to 2014. In Munich, I was at a conference, and the founder of Tinder 
arguably the world's uh, most successful online dating app, made a speech. And the first part was very simple. I'll tell you the first part first, and the second part second. The first part was, you know why we are so successful? Because on traditional dating platforms, people have to read and write and type. Many people don't want to read and write and type. Many people cannot even read <laughs> and write and type. But everybody can swipe. Left is no, right is yes. It is so fucking simple that even the biggest fool on earth can do it. And if you ever build an online business like I have done, make sure that it's, if you have the biggest fool in, in your neighborhood, the biggest fool in your friendship with, amongst your friends, give him five Jägermeisters and three beers and then let him use your website and your app. If he can still use it, you know it's good. If he, has, if he has troubles, go back to the start. One more line, let's say if people have to put in one more line, or if you make a landing page, one additional line costs a 30% conversion. So we try to collect as little information as possible in the beginning to get the highest conversion. It's very, I mean, we, we have the data on it, so it's quite simple. But the Tinder guy in 2014, to which most people didn't listen because they were too drunk from the Munich Oktoberfest beer, didn't quite understand, but he said some, uh, a second thing, which was probably by far more important. But do you know why we are not more successful? Because people have trouble deciding, and they have even more trouble making the first step. They just say hi, or they don't say nothing, and then there's no match. The ball doesn't fall into the hole. The ball fällt nicht ins Loch. But in a few years, an algorithm will come, which based on your past preferences and your digital footprint, will make suggestions whom you should date, and will take the first steps for you. And we'll be sure we're going to be much, much more successful, and the dating experience will be much, much more fulfilling. And Tinder already has such functions. I don't know who of you honestly has used Tinder. <laughs> okay, a few. Some of you are probably not honest. I mean, my secretary, my secretary found her boyfriend on Tinder. I have, let's say, had a few dates uh, quite well on Tinder. I have one again next weekend. But I have also used Tinder to sell academy memberships and I even have found one a real estate developer. You know, she needed some money and we, drew, we wrote on Tinder and I started to get some money to raise money for her. And we also advertise on Tinder, which is just fairly good conversion rates. <laughs> yeah, better than, than CNN, for example. So, uh, let's say. But again, what the guy said has already become reality because you have so-called Tinder topics where Tinder already suggests whom you should date. But again, that's only the beginning. And one of my advisors was just in Las Vegas on the CS fair, and then we discussed a few things. He found out that I was in Davos at the same time, also found a few things, and we're going to talk about this some more. Are you ready? Let's say it. I come to, a, let's say, a, a new city, and I want to go to a good restaurant. I don't like, you know, do I like to go to McDonald's or Burger King? No, except, you know, if I want to have something to throw at stupid tenants or stupid employees or stupid students. Or if I, you know, want to sign a rental agreement with Burger King Incorporated or McDonald's Incorporated, then it would probably go there. But not to consume food. So it would probably be not an ideal choice. But what do I do today? I either call my secretary, select me the best restaurant in the city, or I look on Google. And if a restaurant has, you know, a three-star rating and it says, you know, the steak is like concrete and you have to wait an hour for your food, would I go there? Would my secretary choose it for me? If, uh, let's say, 
I cannot find if the restaurant is open. Would I go there or not? If I don't find the opening times, I wouldn't go there. If I don't find, if it's difficult to, you know, load the lo homepage and it takes half an hour, I probably wouldn't go there. If I cannot see the menu, what is on the menu to eat, except, you know, at Mich three star Michelin restaurants where it's common that you don't see the menu, I wouldn't go there. So what I do, or my secretary does, is check out the digital footprint, the digitale visitenkarte, your digital business card, for the best restaurant in town. And the same thing if I go to a doctor. I want a fast service, I'm a, for a doctor, I'm an ideal client. I'm, I want fast service, I don't want to wait, and I don't care how much it costs. So is she going to go to a doctor, you know, whom, see, whom you see on social media with a bottle? You know, drink, drink? Probably not. And the same thing if I have a stomach problem and you would go to see a doctor on, on Instagram or Facebook, you see a picture, a doctor with, you know, big hamburger, I might also not go to see him. So that's what you currently do about your digital business card. But your digital, who of you checks your digital business card at least once a month? We have an checked our digital visit card every month, zumindest. Nobody, that's not very good. Like everybody who comes into my office, whether it's for private or business purposes, somebody checks the digital footprint of the person very detailed. Everybody who wants to get an apartment from us checks the digital footprint very detailed. And one time I have a banker friend who also finances some of my apartments in Austria, my ugly, small, you know, <laughs> real estate, very hässlichen kleinen Löcher. And she once had a client and I told her, look on social media. For the bankers, it was something very new. But on social media, the, you know, she, because she said, I, she, I wasn't sure because he said he needed more money to renovate his apartment or his villa, but I wasn't so sure. And said, look on social media. And on social media, you always saw pictures of casino gambling. <laughs> and the reason why he wanted the money is to gamble. And luckily, we prevented the bank from giving the loan to the gambler because they, they wouldn't have seen the money anymore because it would have been out in the casinos. But in a few years, it's going to be slightly different. If I sit in my Tesla, the Tesla will already know what kind of preferences I have based on my digital footprint and will send me to the best restaurant. Or Google will automatically know based on my time schedule when I'm in the city and when I want to have lunch. And they will already know that, you know, I like, for example, sova doll or lobster salad or, you know, uh, foie gras, or things like this. And uh, they will automatically send me to the restaurant based on my digital footprint. But they will not, will they send me to the McDonald's if McDonald's pays a million? No, so, uh, Tesla or Google or Facebook will not send me to McDonald's because they know I don't like it. I won't trust the algorithm. But they will probably send me to a very good restaurant, which has over so or so on. But will send me to the best restaurant? No. They will send me to the objectively, subjectively best restaurant. To the restaurant which fits my preference is multiplied by an algorithm who pays the most and understands online sales to the algorithm best, who pays the most for me being a client. Also the subjective, objective, Ah, beste Wahl. Basierend auf meinen Daten, multipliziert mit einem Algorithmus, wer am meisten dafür bezahlt. And I also have an answer for you, who is going to be the biggest client of the real estate agent, or the insurance agent, or the asset manager, or the banker, or the fitness trainer. It's not going to be, Schatzi, ich hab dich lieb. It's also not going to be, Schatz, ich hab dich nicht lieb. It's also not going to be a single person. But it's going to be Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon, or perhaps a few other digital companies which are currently in the making. They're going to be the biggest clients. Because in a few years, the algorithm will make much more of your decisions. Today in online marketing, there are 
is you have to answer three questions correctly. Then you're going to sell the most. Don't make me ask. Don't make me wait. And don't make me think. The algorithm will solve all of it. You don't have to wait. You don't have to ask. And you fucking don't have to think. The algorithm does the thinking for you. And your biggest client as a business person is most likely, at least in the B2C segment, Amazon, Facebook, Google, Apple, and a few other digital companies. They will make the buying decisions on the behalf of most individuals. And that's why you have to learn how the future works, because Amazon, Facebook, Google, all are fighting now to get into the home, to get everywhere. And I, I gave you another question, which you also answered, unfortunately, not correctly, which is the biggest wealth in the Western Hemisphere, which is the most uh, sold motor oil, or the most sold oil hair shampoo. It is simply wrong. And consider the following, because, yeah? No, 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 quite. What is the most sold hair gel, hair shampoo, or motor or engine oil? It's not data. It's still an engine will still need, my Aston Martin will still need engine oil, and I will still need some hair gel if I go for a date. My hair stands usually quite well, you know. But if I go for a nice date arranged on Tinder, I might still need some hair gel. But if I say, Alexa, please bring me some hair gel, which hair gel is it going to bring me? Yeah? Amazon hair gel. And if I want a battery, it's going to bring me an Amazon battery. And if, it's go if I ask for engine oil, it's going to bring me an Amazon engine oil. If I ask for a Shell engine oil, a Duracell battery, or a L'Oreal hair, uh, hair gel, they're going to bring me a L'Oreal hair gel, a Duracell battery, or a Shell motor oil. But how many people are just going to ask, not I want a motor oil for my Aston Martin, I want a specific Shell motor oil for the Aston Martin. Who would, uh, if you ask, who would just say I want engine oil? Now. Yeah. And who would say I want a Shell engine oil? Let's say Mercedes, whatever, yeah? But probably even for the Aston Martin, because it's, it doesn't much make much difference. And that even means that the large companies like Procter & Gamble, like Duracell, like uh, many other consumer products companies, are going to get into big, big trouble. Because their competitor is already Amazon. But that's just the start, because so far the algorithm is still quite stupid. It's not totally stupid, because when I asked him, Alexa, why is Amazon a monopoly, or why doesn't Amazon pay any taxes? It turns off. It doesn't answer. In many cases, it says, I don't know the answer. But on these things, it just simply turns off. So it's not quite as stupid anymore. <laughs> but in a few years, and it's not very far anymore, we are talking quite a few years, these algorithms are going to become extremely smart and dominate everything and change the way the business world. I told you in the beginning, the current form of the digital business world is winner takes it all. But in a few years, it's not going to be winner takes it all, but winner takes it all exponential to winner takes it all. And you're not going to have companies which are worth $1,000 billion, but $10,000 billion or $50,000 billion. It's just a question of another five to 10 years. And these are going to be the companies we should do something very specific, which I'm going to talk about right now. Who of you would like to uh, go? You have two choices. You have one of the best. WHO is a very good university for party. I think you are in big competition with <laughs> European Business School in Österreich, Wiki. But I do have to say that sometimes WHO does it qu quite slightly better. Slightly. And you have a choice. You can either go over to one of the, so to the best WHO party of the year, including full champagne, whatever you want to drink, full budget, or you can have dinner with an old 81-year mathematician professor who has a long beard. It looks like, you know, a Gartenzwerg. I don't know the translation in English, unfortunately. Which one would go to the WHO party? 
All champagne, all drinks inclusive. And who would like to have dinner with the 81-year-old mathematician <laughs> with a long beard? The problem is he's so bored at 81 that he also writes mathematical papers where he still gets on us. But that's only his part-time job. His other job is a little bit more, let's say, specific. He is the founder and major shareholder, and major decision maker of Renaissance Capital, the biggest or most successful hedge fund in the world, which has netted him an income of about $30 billion and another $30 billion in trust on the Bahamas. He has a good friend and competitor called Ray Dalio from Bridgewater, Ray Dalio is also a famous author, has uh, made the books Principles, which we has also applied in our company, and uh, Big Debt Crisis, both so I would highly recommend to read. It's very good reading indeed. And uh, a reporter asks him, Ray and James, why are you fucking so more, ten times more successful than all the other hedge fund managers? All the other hedge fund managers are only billionaires. But you have 30 billion. Why are you so rich? And Mr. Simmons answered the old mathematician. You know, it's a very simple answer. All hedge funds use algorithms. But we do something slightly different. We just own the algorithms, we program them, and we monitor and control them, but we do not interfere with the algorithm. And all other hedge fund managers still think they are smarter and interfere with the algorithm. That's a slight difference. That's why we're 10 times or 20 times as more successful than most other hedge funds. Lasst euch das auf der Zunge zergehen. Keep it in your mind. Have it tattooed in your mind. We own the algorithms. We control them. We program them. But we do not interfere anymore. Keep this into your brain. Because that's going to be part of your future. Mr. Simmons, the old mathematician, also had, let's say, a servant. He also happened to be his CEO. His name was Robert, Robert Mercer. And he also had his daughter called Rebecca. And they didn't like Obama's politics. And they thought, let's pay some politics. And uh, with a 28-year-old gay Canadian guy with pink hair, they set up a company called Cambridge Analytica which took via various algorithms, Facebook data, and, uh, you know, sent every voter what he wanted to hear. A liberal voter in New Hampshire, where there was just the primary season, they said, we'll have responsible gun control and we'll make sure that all qualified people can enter the United States. And in rural Texas or Mississippi, we will say, we'll make sure every American has 10 guns. And we'll make sure that we pick the biggest wall on Earth, bigger than the Chinese wall and the Berlin wall together. Every voter gets exactly what he wants to hear. And the Brexit, let's say, was a pre-dinner course. And Trump, the election of probably is going to be in the second term, was the main course. Algorithms have started to make politics. But again, that's just the beginning. Because in a few years, it's not unconceivable that if you ask Alexa or Tinder or whomever, you can ask, what should I buy? And they say, well, buy an Amazon battery. Buy, I'll send you the battery. Or there will be a default option, and it will also send you this to you automatically. But they could also ask you, whom should I vote for? And Alexa or Google or whatever they'll say, based on your type preferences. The best candidate for you would be whatever you choose, whatever is based on your preferences. And perhaps there will also be a default option which also say, should I automatically vote for you? And perhaps there will going to be more default option. We don't are not going to say, should I vote for you? It will automatically do it, and you just might have, to have the possibility of turning the default option off. That's just a slight difference, but this could change the way that democracy works. This could easily change the way that a few algorithms, the guys who control the algorithm, program them, 
and monitor them, decide who is the next president of the United States of America, the next German chancellor, the next British prime minister, the next French president. Let I ask you another question. You have the option to have two fridges. It's very cool, Schränke. One fridge is really cool. Whenever you go out, come home Friday night and you have guests, it has enough beer and vodka, whatever you want to drink. Who would love such a fridge? Everything what you want. You never have to go to a supermarket, everything is there. You know, party, vodka, beer, wine, champagne, whatever you want. Who wants this? Yeah. And it's even a little bit more. So just make, I guess, so you want a little bit extra, have a little bit extra thirst. There's one more beer available, or two. <coughs> There's another fridge on the side, which you can also order. The fridge is somewhat different, because it says, when you want to order a beer, no, you didn't move enough. You're too fat. You didn't exercise. Your cholesterol uh, value is too high. And it will just put into your fridge a banana and a yogurt. Who would prefer this fridge? You can only choose one, okay, very few. I will come back later to these two fridges, but think about of this experiment. It would be quite nice to have everything. I'm, I'm personally not so sure which one I would like, because both fridges come with some kind of, you know, a side effect. Yes, there's a, both fridges stand for something, which I'll come to momentarily. But we'll go back again, just recently, to a simple thing. I went to my apartment in Vienna with my Tesla. And there's a one-way street, and I went into the one-way street, and a car came by driving into me. And I blew the horn, boo, 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 boo. And I said, are you stupid? Why do you drive into me? Didn't you see it's a one-way street? And the guy said, Google said, said I should drive this way. <laughs> Yes. If we tell people, you know, how to, without, in a, let's say, in a non-EU country, if they don't have data roaming, how to get there, they say, I don't know. Yeah. Let me make an experiment. What is 28 times 28? What is 28 mal 28? 28 mal 28. What is 5% of 120,000? 5% of 120,000, guys. You are in the elitist university studying computer programming, guys. What? 5%, easy. 5% of 120,000, what is this? 12,000, oh my god. <laughs> 6,000, yeah. But I think you have proven the experiment that the existence of calculating tools, starting with uh, calculators which I had in high school and today mobile phones, Apple iWatches and anything else, people have stopped learning how to calculate. I mean, it still helps in the real estate business because if you, you know, negotiate with somebody and you're quick in your head, it can give you some advantages. If the other guy is slow and you're much faster, it can also, as an investment banker, if you do, you know, sell companies, or do financing, and you're much quicker calculating than the other guys, you have some advantages, admittedly. But considering that you are one of the elitist, most elitist universities in Germany and study programming, so something which requires a bit of a mathematical brain, it's a shame that doing these simple things causes big problems. I mean, it's not any, it's always the case. Even by my own company, my secretary often makes stupid mistakes, and I always call her and say, well, what did you calculate? She says, I don't know. Yeah. The, algorithm, the computer said whatever, yeah? And the same thing is that the algorithm, Google already navigates you. You don't need to know how to navigate. 20 years ago, when I started living in Boston, in Harvard, and in New York City, there was no Google in there. There was a map, physical, or you had to look. Otherwise, you couldn't go to A to B, that was it. You had to look at a street map. That was all that existed. So when I took a drive to New York City, from Boston, I had an old Volvo from my friend, I had to study the map. And then I had to remember how to, which, which way in New York to go, because otherwise I would have ended up in Harlem or the Bronx, which at those times was not quite so safe. Things have changed a lot in the recent years, and the real estate has changed too, but at those times it looked like a war zone. So you had to drive, be careful where you drove. 
But today Google does everything for you. But in a few years, the algorithm will take away most people's thinking. And I give you an example from a party where I recently was. <laughs> recently was at a party and a lot of the guys were in the bathroom. It was locked. They wanted to pee. Were they pissing in? But it was unfortunately not possible because the bathroom was locked and there were chemical experiments being done in the bathroom. I hope you know what I suggest with this. But there were at least, you know, there was a chemical laboratory on some people in the bathroom. So I said, I to go outside to take a piss. And the house dog followed me and I played with him. And 20, and, and 20 minute, uh, minutes afterwards, I played with this little doggy. We went in. And the door to the bathroom or to the chemical laboratory opened. And the dog started screaming because it didn't smell. It smelled very strangely. And I said to the guys, why are you so stupid? Why are you doing this? Even your little doggy doesn't like it. He screams like if he's on a plane which lands. And he said, yeah, look, your life is cool. You come with uh, your fast car and go home. But our life sucks. We want to be ourselves in a different world. <laughs> but all that is going to be possible in a few years. Not the, 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 uh, in Silicon Valley, when I was last time at Singularity University, the tools are not quite ready. In one year, they're going to be ready. It'll be integrated in your normal classes. And it's going to be like a combination of augmented and virtual reality. <laughs> in the augmented reality, the virtual reality is going to be a lot better. What happens if you drive in the rain with a Ferrari in Switzerland or an Aston Martin? What happens? It rains, you know, then you have to be careful that you don't skid. You know, then sometimes you know, have to have a glass near the you know, roof because it, British and Italian cars tend to leak, especially convertibles. Sometimes you need a hair dryer to dry it out. And if in Switzerland you go too fast, what happens? Was passiert, wenn du in der Schweiz zu schnell fährst? Na, ja, nicht nur teuer. Da gibt es einen Kerker. You go to jail. The car goes to jail and you go to jail. You know, one of my, the friend of one of my colleagues, he once was caught on radar with 180 kilometers. He luckily left Switzerland beforehand, but he, he dares not to go back to the country because he would go one year to jail and the fine would be about 250,000 Swiss francs. But in a virtual world, if you drive 180 kilometers to the Swiss Alps and drive away from the police car and tell that police guy, fuck you, you know, you don't go to jail. There's going to be some music and it's going to be applause and they're going to encourage you as an algorithm to buy some more. Today, in a mod ball, I once took a race which was called mod balls like gumball from London to Ibiza. I went with a Tesla and I told the guys, go slow. But one guy in Switzerland, he didn't just didn't go slow. He was very stupid. And he even told, uh, showed this to the police guys. And he came with you know, an Audi RS4, which was not licensed for having 700 horsepower. And they took him to jail. And they, had 20, uh, they levied two, 22 points against him. And they wanted five-year jail time for you know, uh, violating speed limits, excessive driving. You know, <laughs> insulting the government and the police, having an illegal car, you know, having drugs, driving under the influence of drugs, having alcohol, driving under the influence of alcohol, and so on, you know. And they wanted a total of 1.25 million Swiss francs of, uh, of fines, confiscation of the car, and for him, his partner, five years, his partner, two years jail time, and for him, five years jail time. And even for me, they stopped me with the Tesla because I was going 84. Because for some reason the, the, the road was going a little bit down, and I had put the speedometer on 80 or 82. And they, and they stopped me and said, Da is a bus anbracht von 80 Franken. <laughs> and I, said, I said, I didn't quite understand. He said, Ja, but they sind billig davon gekommen. Da sind andere zahlen da viele Tausend oder Zehntausend oder Hunderttausende Franken. Wir haben schon 25 Fahrzeuge beschlagnahmt heute. Ihres beschlagnahmen wir nicht. <laughs> but in the virtual world, none of this is going to happen. You just have fun and drive away from the police and the sun always shines. So it's most likely that the majority of people are going to beam yourself in this world. And the big danger is that most people 
as they have stopped learning how to calculate or how not to navigate, will stop learning how to decide. And the algorithm will make the decisions. Which insurance policy you buy, which apartment to buy, to which doctor you go, to which restaurant you go, whom you're going to date, with whom you're going to have sex, and whom you're going to vote for. It's all going to be done automatically. And the digital avatar, which is already functioning in some ways, is going to be your most important personal connection. In the post-industrial world, the number of, let's say, people whom you can trust has already decreased from about 3.2 to 1.9, the answer of Vertrauensleute. It's expected to go down to 1.5 or 1.4, as it is already in post-industrialist societies like in Tokyo, in Seoul, in Hong Kong, or in New York City. And the human interaction is going to be replaced by a digital avatar. The digital avatar is going to quite start quite simple. Instead of calling my secretary, I'm going to tell, talk into my mobile phone. I want a restaurant. Oh, it's already going to automatically send me there. Or automatically send me to the doctor. Or automatically you know, arrange a date if it already knows in which video I am. And, if, and look for apartments automatically. And su suggest insurance agents to whom to do. And perhaps it will have a default option where it already does it automatically, so I don't have to do anything anymore. But it's also going to entertain me. It's going to fulfill my sexual desires, whatever they may be. And it's if I'm lonely, it's going to make me laugh. If I'm sad, it's also going to make me laugh. And it's going to be my most trusted advisor. And it's going to have so much data that it's a combination of what today your parents, your grandparents, your kids, all your friends, all the people who you know you, plus everything what Google, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and so on know of you today will be much less than the digital avatar is going to know of you. Already four location points of a person are sufficient with 80% likelihood to figure out which person it is. Four points, at selected at random. If you have four billion data points on each person, on movement, on payment, on sleeping patterns, on medical information, on uh, travel patterns, and on, uh, on all this stuff, on uh, brain waves, the algorithm can do almost unlimited things. And this is not only, we are not talking about fantasy, uh, fantasy world. We are talking the next few years. The prototypes are already going to be there. And the avatar is going to be much better. Because my secretary sometimes is sick, sometimes she is careless. Just recently she booked a fl flight to Frankfurt wrong, cost me 600 euros. The avatar is never going to book a fl flight to Frankfurt wrong. He's always going to choose the cheapest flight, make sure that I sit in front on the aisle, will I arrange everything, including that my car drives me to the airport automatically. I don't have to wait for the driver, for the driver to fall asleep. So I will probably choose it. Also medical data. I, was, I don't know if you realize it, but on Monday I was in the, had an operation on my teeth for hours. It was not so pleasant. Have you realized it, that I have an operation on my teeth? You know, and if you, uh, but uh, you know, there was already modern technology because, let's say, the, the, the machine took the scan and the digital printer already printed my teeth while the dentist, you know, treated them and everything went almost semi-automatically already. And normally I have a second watch, you know, I have a, one real watch and a data collecting watch which collects everything from sleeping patterns and, let's say, uh, stress levels and pulse and everything, and sooner or later you're going to have a medical data set that can, can predict diseases and prevent diseases, so it's going to be quite useful, so even people like myself are going to use it. But most people are going to totally and absolutely give up all their decision power to the algorithm. And I give you already two examples. In the United States, it's already common that an algorithm makes a recommendation for sentencing for a criminal in court. The judge still has to make the final ruling, but the algorithm suggests, suggests okay, for drunk driving, 
because it's the third time this guy goes to jail for two years and six months. In 99.2% of the cases, the judge follows the algorithm. And uh, if, uh, if the guy who goes sent to jail asks the judge, why did you do this? The answer is because the algorithm said so. He doesn't say anything. Why? The algorithm said 99.2%. And think about it. If you go out and say, at night, if you have 10 people and you say, where do we go out partying at night? What do most people say? Na, sag du. You say. You say, sag du. Most people cannot decide anyway. And it will be a pleasant thing if the algorithm will make the decision. Do you still remember the question I asked you about the fridges? With the Kühlschränke. The fridges represent two different systems which are currently fighting for world domination. Europe is only, you know, a spectator from history, unfortunately. Germany especially. But this is the first, uh, uh, the first one can be, is manufactured in the United States. You know, Trump and his colleagues are shareholders. And it's sold by Amazon. And it always motivates you to buy a little bit more. To consume a little bit more. To get whatever you want. Or whatever the algorithm thinks you want. And it will make your desires to consume more. That's the American capitalist. Individual, 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 uh, individualistic fridge. That's the first one. But it comes with a side note, it manipulates you and makes you addicted to always want more. And to feed the system and make the big companies even bigger and richer. That's made in the United States of America. The Amazon fridge. The second fridge is manufactured by Alibaba and sold by Alibaba. It's monitored by the Chinese Communist Party. And whenever you think of wanting a beer, it automatically sends a message to the government and says, this guy could want to have want a beer. He's not acting in the interest of the country. And if you actually order a beer, you might already get a visit from the Chinese state police asking you if you're an alcoholic, and they will already increase your insurance uh, premiums and if you ever would think, or even consider thinking that Xi Jinping is not the best man on earth, and not, you know, the best president, a godlike figure who can never ever make mistakes in his life, and that the Communist Party is the best of all parties, the best of the best, the brightest of the brightest, the biggest of the biggest, then a few guys from the Chinese military are going to come and arrest you or kill you. That's a side effect of this fridge. And if you're like me, who would, uh, in China would probably end every speech, Xi Jinping is the brightest man on earth. Let us pray for Xi Jinping and his brightness and his intelligence and his wisdom. And it shall always be in China. But if I think internally a little bit different, they would, they would send a whole army to me because then I'm very dangerous and they would put, put me to jail immediately. And today in the world, we see a fight between these two systems. The fight is uh, seen with, for example, companies like Huawei, but also between Amazon and Alibaba, between WeChat and Facebook and Google. This fight is very real. It's shown on television. It's shown in the trade wars. People are arrested for it. And in the end, one of these guys is going to win. And it's going to be the guys who are best at controlling the algorithms, owning them, and programming them and who do not have to interfere, like Mr. Simmons and Mr. Ray Dalio. And what I would like to wish you is that you, that you belong to the guys who always keep your own thinking, who do not let the computer and the algorithm and the people who own it, program it, and control it, take over your brain and your thinking. If you do this, your future will be very bright because there are tons of opportunities, and there are all the tons of things 
which require a lot of ethical understanding and ethical questions. But if you belong to the guys who let the, the algorithm take over your brain, you're going to belong to the masses. In the past, they always said the world is divided between have and have nots, between rich and poor. That's going to increase. The world is also going to be divided between people who are digital literate and digital illiterate. But the biggest gap ever will be between the people who let their train be taken over by the algorithm and the people who still make their own decisions and take their own fate into their own hands. And that is called freedom. And I can tell you one thing, freedom is still the best thing. It's the best thing of being rich. It's the best thing of being smart. And I wish you both that you both stay rich and smart and honest. Because the future needs people who are honest, who have the right ethical standards, and to put their foot on the accelerator. And not the algorithm does it, you do it yourself. Thank you very much. Best regards.